Today's video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN, of whom more in a bit. Today we're going to look at another of the stops on South London's tram network. But this is kind of a two-for-one thing, because not only is this a tram stop, it's also an abandoned station. Today we are paying a visit to Merton Park. The place that we now call Merton Park was largely rural up until the final part of the 19th century. The River Wandel ran nearby, which supplied power to dozens of water mills, which, in the days before steam, made it something of an industrial powerhouse. One of the first railways, the Surrey Iron Railway, was opened in 1803 to serve these industries. The river was too shallow and fast-flowing to navigate by boat. That railway ran from Croydon to Wandsworth and ended up closing down in 1846. But that wasn't the end of the story. You see, there were three parties who were somewhat hungrily eyeing up the route of that line. In fact, the vultures had been circling even before the Surrey Iron Railway closed. What you had was three different interest groups. Firstly, local industries liked having a railway, but they wanted something more substantial than the old Surrey Iron, which was narrow-gauge, horse-powered, and unconnected to the wider network. Then there were two railway companies, and here we get into the whole complicated mess that is 19th century railway politics. The London and South Western Railway, or LSWR, had a London terminus at Nine Elms, but they really wanted to get closer to the city. The London and Brighton Railway had a terminus at London Bridge, which was closer to the city, but owned by another company, the London and Croydon Railway. The London and Brighton didn't like being beholden to another railway, especially one that was charging them a lot of rent. The LSWR planned a new terminus at Waterloo Bridge and suggested to the Brighton boys that perhaps they could share. That might sound terribly philanthropic, but it really wasn't. The Croydon Railway was planning to extend to Portsmouth, which was the LSWR's turf. The LSWR hoped that if they could lure the Brighton boys away, then that would drive a wedge between them and the Croydon lads, and the scheme would collapse. The old Surrey Iron Railway was key to this. The London and Brighton had a line running through Croydon, the LSWR had a line running through Wimbledon. The thinking was that by laying a new line partially along the route of the old one, they could connect the two main lines together, and then, well, they sort of lost interest. The London and Brighton merged with the London and Croydon and three other railways in 1846 to form the London, Brighton and South Coast Railway, so they didn't need the LSWR anymore. And that probably would have been it, but then an engineer named George Parker Bidder started promoting a Wimbledon and Croydon Railway, again using the Surrey Iron Railway. This would give the local industries the mainline connections they wanted. Well, the LBSC and the LSWR might not have needed the line, but they sure as heck weren't going to let anyone else have it either. The line was opened in 1855. Then, in 1856, the LBSC negotiated the right to operate it. And then in 1857, the LSWR negotiated the right to run over it, getting the right to operate the section from Mitcham to Wimbledon in 1859. So that's how there came to be a railway through Merton. But Merton Park Station wouldn't open until 1868. That would have to wait for another railway, the Tooting, Merton and Wimbledon Railway. The TMW was only a short railway, a couple of branch lines around the Streatham and Merton area. It was promoted by the local copper mill owner, William Shears, who I'm pretty sure would later join Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club band. The main purpose of it was freight traffic from the many local industries, but there was also a passenger service, and that's how, finally, we get to Merton Park Station. Hey, look over there. Look, right there. Okay, never mind. Well, uh, while you were looking over there, you missed the really smooth seg into talking about today's sponsor, Surfshark VPN. Merton Park yourself right there, and I'll tell you all about it. So these days, the internet is a wild and crazy place where fraudsters and data thieves run rampant. So if you're going to go a-roaming, you'd better know what you're doing. 
Or you could just use Surfshark. Surfshark uses advanced encryption to hide your identity online, which gives you an extra layer of protection from the sort of people who like to snoop on you. But that's not all. One of the neat little side benefits is that you can appear to be, virtually at least, anywhere in the world. So you can get around region locks and government censorship, you can get access to streaming content unavailable in your region, or, this is the one I found kind of neat, you can get great prices when shopping online by taking advantage of region-specific pricing. It's so exciting that I used the word region three times in one sentence. You know what's even more exciting? By clicking the link in the description below, or using the QR code that's popping up on screen about now, and entering the code JAGO, you can get three months extra free. The whole thing comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee, so even better. Well, anyway, now for a seamless transition back to the video... Yay! The site of the station was chosen for two reasons. Firstly, it was the junction between the TMW and the Wimbledon and Croydon. I suppose for consistency I should say WC. And secondly, it was near where the main road crossed the railway. The station here was very basic. Actually, it didn't even have a platform. It was basically just a place where trains stopped. The station was opened under the name Lower Merton. Elaborate facilities weren't considered necessary because there wasn't really much here. But that was soon to change. A developer named John Innes started planning out a new suburb to be called Merton Park. He'd seen how popular nearby Wimbledon was and figured he could build a commuter town of his own. The name Merton Park was meant to evoke country living. Not that it panned out that way in the long term, but once people had bought their houses, it didn't really matter. Of course, it wouldn't do for the residents of lovely Merton Park to stand in the mud, so Innes pushed the railway to upgrade the facilities. In 1870, it was rebuilt. Here's the old station house. Unfortunately, the houses that Innes had hoped for were rather slow to arrive, so I would imagine the railway were gritting their teeth somewhat at having put all that money into a station that didn't have many passengers. In 1887, the station's name was changed to the far more genteel Merton Park. While the service was fairly well used by this point, it wasn't hugely convenient. The majority of passenger trains only ran between Streatham and Wimbledon. If you wanted to commute, you'd have to change trains. In 1907, trams started running along the road. Not only did they serve several of the stations along the Tooting, Merton and Wimbledon line, but they were cheaper than the train. Buses arrived in 1910, and aside from those trains that did run into London, there wasn't much incentive to use Merton Park Station. In fact, given the distance between the stations, even walking between Merton Park and Wimbledon wasn't a bad alternative. Outside of rush hour, when there were trains all the way to London, there were few passengers at Merton Park. In 1916, passenger services were withdrawn for the remainder of the First World War. The route was considered far more important as a freight connection for military traffic, so the not-very-well-used commuter services were considered a fair sacrifice. Well, that wasn't a great idea in the long run, because of course there were other transport alternatives. When services were brought back after the war, few people used them. The companies decided to cut back on the stations along this route. Merton Park lost its booking office and parcels facilities. Tickets had to be bought on the train. The service was cut back even further, consisting largely of rail motors, a single coach with a small locomotive built into it. A popular economy measure in the early 20th century. Between 1918 and 1925, Merton Park was renamed Merton Park Halt. Two things of note happened in the early 1920s that affected Merton Park. The first to mention is that in 1923, both the LBSC and the LSWR became part of the Southern Railway, under a state-mandated grouping of all Britain's railways. The second was that the Underground Group proposed extending their district railway from Wimbledon to Sutton, and their City and South London Railway from Clapham to Morden where it would meet the district and possibly continue all the way to Sutton. Well, the Southern Railway and its predecessors did not like that one bit. The Underground was an electric railway that offered a fast, direct route into central London, 
and it would undoubtedly filch many of the passengers in the areas served by the railway. The Southern complained, but they didn't really have a leg to stand on. It wasn't like they were offering a decent service, so they quickly brought the service back up to scratch, offering longer and more convenient trains hauled by more modern locomotives. Not quite top of the line, but a big improvement on what had gone before. In 1925, Merton Park got its stuff back. The Underground did not get their line to Sutton, but they did extend the city in South London to Morden, and it's now part of the Northern Line. As predicted, this drew passengers from the railway in areas where the two overlapped. The Southern completely gave up on the line from Merton Park to Tooting, withdrawing passenger services in 1929. Passengers using the remaining line had to cross two abandoned platforms to get to it. At the same time, the Southern Railway was looking to electrify the line, perhaps in a last-ditch attempt to attract passengers. They quickly realised that this was going to be a lot of money for potentially not many passengers. Therefore, for part of the distance, they only electrified one of the two tracks and ran it as a single-track branch line. They used two coach trains that the old LBSC had built for their South London line and found unsuitable. Still, if they had been hoping that modernisation would bring more passengers, they were to be disappointed. In 1948, the railways were nationalised, and British Railways, the new organisation in charge, started looking at the line through Merton Park as a possible closure. The argument for keeping it open was an odd one. There was still plenty of freight traffic, and since the passenger service was fairly minimal, BR concluded that it wasn't worth withdrawing. But pressure continued to increase as BR looked to economise more and more. Freight traffic declined, making it harder to justify the line's continued existence. In 1965, Sunday services were withdrawn. In 1971, it was publicly announced that the line was to close. Well, despite the relatively low passenger numbers, the outcry was enormous. Local MPs raged at BR, pointing out that car ownership was low and public transport was otherwise inadequate. Local residents conducted their own research. One passenger discovered that the journey from West Croydon to Wimbledon was three times as long by car as by train. So in 1974, BR again relented. The following year, the freight line to Tooting was pulled up, meaning that Merton Park would no longer be a junction and passengers would no longer have to cross an abandoned line to get to it. The part of the line leading from the station is now a footpath. Still, even though Merton Park had had a stay of execution, the line was a bit of a stone in BR's shoe. Too useful to close, not popular enough to make money. But a solution was to come from the northeast. In 1980, the Tyne and Weir Metro opened. This was Britain's first modern light rail system. It used old railway lines, but thanks to light rail technology, it was able to operate them far more cheaply than British Rail had. Light Rail came to London in 1987 with the opening of the Docklands Light Railway. And this seemed like a solution to the problem of the Wimbledon to Croydon line. London Transport and Croydon Council put their heads together and came up with the Tramlink, a system that would revitalise underperforming or closed lines, it would relieve congestion in Croydon Town Centre, and give the poorly served New Addington a rail connection. The scheme was approved. In 1997, once again, Merton Park's closure was announced. But this time it wasn't intended to be the end of the story. A new tram stop was built a short distance from the old station, closer to the main road, and this opened on the 30th of May 2000. The entrance is on the site of an old signal box that had closed in 1982. Aside from the station house, which was converted into a private residence, there's another surviving relic of the old station but it's quite a long way off. There used to be a footbridge crossing the track. It would be replaced with a crossing at ground level, but the folk at the Swanage Railway saw that the footbridge was going and said, well, if you're not using it, and bought it and took it to Corfe Castle Station, where you can still see it today. As a tram stop, Merton Park is far more useful than it ever was as a railway station. It offers fast, frequent and cheap services. It's just a shame that it took 132 years to crack the problem. Well, I do hope you enjoyed today's video. If so, please do leave a like and consider subscribing for more. I should also mention that there used to be a band called the Merton Parkers.
Nothing to do with the station as far as I'm aware, but if I don't mention them, then people will complain in the comments section. Anyway, I would like to thank my donors on Ko-fi, on Patreon, and here on YouTube for your kind support. You are the footpath to my abandoned railway. I would also like to thank Surfshark VPN for sponsoring this video. Click on the link in the description below to take advantage of their generous offer. And I will see you all again very soon. Cheerio.